Historical Society and people from New Hartford Historical Society. I didn't know I was going to be doing this, or I would have looked at my notes and said, how many years? This is this 30 years, whatever? Oh, no, it's uh, almost 40, 40, 40, 45 years. 45 years, wow, well, almost my age. <laughs> so, in any event, we used to be down at the, uh, the medical center there at the corner of uh, Middle Southern Road, which is now the Gilroy Insurance. I remember meeting there one time years ago when Bob Dicker was president. Anyhow, it's good to see everybody from New Hartford. Like, we don't know most of you, but I don't see any Clinton people here either. Where, where's the Clinton people today? I don't know. It's that COVID virus keeping all of us from uh, participating normally. In any event, welcome. Uh, can they go downstairs, Jim, afterwards or not? No, Can't go downstairs. You can't see our permanent displays downstairs. You'll have to come back some other time. But I'm sorry about that. But look, they can look at the ones here, right? They can look at yes. the exhibits yes. in this room. Okay, Jim will now take over and introduce the speaker. Again, welcome and have a good day. Thank you, Dick. You did well for having it thrust at you at the last minute. So, appreciate that. Um, <clears throat> our guest speaker today is uh, John Kozlowski, and uh, he's a local attorney, but more importantly, uh, for the purposes of today, a uh, local historian, um, and a, uh, a historical society member and a native of New Hartford. He has a lifelong interest in uh, the area's rail and trolley history. Um, and I'm dying to know, today's program is entitled Remembering the Hartford Clinton Trolley and Ned Plunkett's Horse. All right, so with that in mind, I will hand the, uh, the white down microphone to you. Thank you. Well, uh, thanks for coming out today. It's uh, unusual here in November to have 70 degrees and brilliant blue skies, so we're competing with that. We have a good group here, and again, thanks for coming. Uh, just a little bit more about myself. As uh, Jim mentioned, I'm a native of New Hartford. I moved up there in 1965 and started kindergarten went all through New Hartford School. And I grew up on the corner of uh, Merritt Place and Avalon Road, which is just a stone's throw from where the Clinton Trolley right-of-way was and the right-of-way for the New York, Ontario and Western Railway, which connected Clinton to the outside world. So as a kid, I had explored the old roadbeds. It just piqued my interest. Actually, I think what got me interested in trains was my dad had a Lionel train set from the early 1930s when he was uh, very young, and I must have seen that when I was growing up pretty young and made a big impression. So, another thing is that I belong to a local chapter of the National Railway Historical Society, and I also have a uh, just by way, by way of background, a, a Facebook uh, page called Railroading Rambler and a YouTube channel also by that name which focuses on local history and railroad operations. When I was very young, my mother didn't have a driver's license so we would often take the bus to Clinton and we would catch the bus uh, right across where Presto Cleaners used to be, which wasn't too far from where some one of the trolley stops was. So. It all kind of uh, molded together, and that's what kind of fired my interest in this and this topic. So, by way of background, the Utica trolley system really began in 1862. Was incorporated, and back then everything was by horse-drawn wagon. There, the cars were on rails, but the horses provided the power. And operations really began about 1863. It wasn't until the late 1880s when the lines were uh, electrified and the line to Clinton, which we'll uh, focus on today, was uh, uh, begun in 1901 and it was electrified right from the beginning. At the peak of operation, the Utica trolley system had 16 lines connecting Utica to uh, different parts of the, the city and to neighboring communi communities. There were uh, 
50 miles of track, including the line to Clinton. Again, at its peak, there were 100 cars. The Clinton line was abandoned in 1936. The last Utica trolleys rolled in 1941, including uh, to New Hartford. So they've been gone quite a long time. The buses took over right after, and they've been around ever since. So the push to have a trolley line to Clinton had a lot of uh, uh, different factors behind it. In 1901, the, as I mentioned, the village of Clinton had a railroad, the New York, Ontario, and Western. The station was right down near where the Agway is today. But the train service, the passenger service, was just four trains each day in 1901. Four trains to Utica, four trains back from Utica to Clinton. So it did connect Clinton to the outside world, but it wasn't, it wasn't insignificant, but it wasn't uh, the best. So the merchants in Clinton, Hamilton College, the people, they all pushed very hard for the trolley system. And I will mention also that with the railroad, from here to Utica, there were just a couple of stops. The first stop was the New Hartford Station, which is down where the U-Haul building is on Shenango Ave. Then the next stop was Columbia Street. The final stop was Ontario Western Station near the New York Central Main Line. So you could go from Utica to Clinton, but it wasn't like there were a lot of intermediate stops. If you wanted to go downtown, you'd get off at the O&W station, and you'd either, have, you'd either have to walk to your destination or take the trolley. So that was uh, part of the thing, too. The railroad was good, but the trolley could offer better service. Now, there's a monument out here in the Village Green saying that it's nine miles from here to Utica. So one time, several years ago, I wanted to say, well, where does that nine miles end? Well, right from the village green, it goes all the way down to where the Mohawk River used to be before they rechanneled it to put Union Station in, in 1914. So it is nine miles from this point to uh, Utica, and that's where the trolley would have been uh, headquartered in the beginning. It would start from near Union Station. And think about it, walking nine miles. Now, Ray, Mr. Philo, and I went to Philmont together, which is a, a National Boy Scout reservation in New Mexico, and over a course of 10 days, we hiked, we hiked 50 to 70 miles. So back in 1901, unless you were going to take one of the few passenger trains out of town, how would you get to Utica or even the village of New Hartford, which is five miles from this point? Well, you'd have to walk, and to walk nine miles, if you're in good shape, you could probably do it in two and a half hours. It'd probably take a little bit longer if you weren't in great shape to get all the way downtown. Or you could take a horse. I don't know how fast horses gallop, but I don't think people would be going down Utica Road, you know, at uh, racetrack speeds. So, uh, you know, you could take a horse, you take a wagon. Wagons probably would go six to seven, eight miles an hour. So it would still take good amount of time to get to the center of the city and and then of course around the weather. So another interesting thing is that in 1901 when the trolley line opened the roads weren't very good of course they nothing like they were today and in the United States in 1901 there were just about 15,000 registered automobiles that's the whole country and so it was just the very beginning of the automobile age. There probably weren't very many automobiles around here in Oneida County, and whatever was around, you probably, your horse was probably more dependable than a 1901 automobile. <laughs> of course, there were no buses back then either. So, so there was a big push, really, to extend the trolley from the village of New Hartford to Clinton. Whitesboro and New Hartford were connected to um, Utica by the trolley system. Clinton wasn't. Now when I talk about New Hartford, I'm really talking about up to what I used to, what I grew up calling the Point School, which is now 
what is it, Barbara, the Village Point Apartments? Correct, where are the south? Right, the New Hartford Historical Societies and that location. I grew up knowing it as the Point School. Before it was called the Point School, it was the New Hartford High School. And so many of you probably know right where that is in the Village of New Hartford. Well, that's where the trolley system stopped in 1901. So they wanted to extend it five miles up to Clinton. And that's what they began to do in, uh, in 1901. It was really a, a boom to businesses in Clinton. It helped move people. It moved products because the trolley company would move express packages, would move luggage. And it helped people coming into town too. Let's say you are a Hamilton College professor and it's 1901 and you just come back from a trip to the Big Apple and you're taking a late train or you arrive in Utica 8 or 9 o'clock at night before the trolley came in all the way to Clinton the farthest you could go by trolley would be to the point at New Hartford so it would be a little more difficult to move between Utica and, and Clinton When the trolley came into service here in December of 1901, we've talked already about the o &W, the railroad having uh, four trains each way between Utica and Clinton every day. Well, the trolley began, its first trip out of Utica was six o'clock in the morning. It took 45 minutes to get out here, so they're averaging about 12 miles an hour. But there are probably 40 or 50 potential stops they could make between uh, uh, down by Union Station and right here in the village. And between with the Clinton Trolley extension itself from the village of New Hartford to Clinton, there were about 20 stops. So it just increased tremendously the amount of, of uh, options available to people in Clinton and even in New Hartford. To, uh, to move quickly between points. Anyhow, when the uh, trolley first began in 1901, the first, train, or the first trolley from Utica was 6 a.m., and they moved every hour after that, and the first trolley from Clinton to Utica would return at 7, all the way up to midnight. So there was tremendous service, it began on the hour. After a while, it was so success successful, it went every half an hour. So. It was uh, really phenomenally successful uh, for a long time. The package, there was an express station in Clinton. It's lo it was located right where the Clinton Pottery is now in the corner of Utica uh, Street and BDF. I don't know if it was in that same building, but that's where the uh, express packages would, would go. So, how much did it cost to ride the trolley in 1901? It, it sounds cheap, but was it really? Because if you were traveling within Clinton or Kirkland, it was five cents. Today, that's a dollar fifty. Between Clinton and New Hartford, it was ten cents, or three dollars today. If you wanted to go from Clinton down to uh, downtown Utica, one way would be fifteen cents, or four dollars and fifty cents today. If you wanted to be adventurous and take the round trip between Clinton and Utica and back to Clinton, it was 25 cents or $7.40 today. There was no government subsidy back in the beginning, and I don't think the trolley line was ever subsidized by the government. The Centro, the, the bus service that you might see uh, going through Clinton today and New Hartford, cost $1.50 to go anywhere in the system. And of course, the Centro is subsidized, so it's not, you're not paying the real fare like you might have back in 1901. And today, the bus service to Clinton, there's eight buses a day, Monday through Friday, and there's six on Saturdays. There's no service on Sundays. So, the construction of the trolley began, and the real push for it, as I mentioned, began in 1901 with a, a big survey that was uh, done from the village of New Hartford by the Point School all the way here to the 
uh, Village Green in Clinton, or the Village Park. I don't know if it's more commonly referred to as the Village Park or the Village Green. I always call it the Village Green. So, what's it called here in Clinton, folks? Green. Park. Park Green? There's no official name. No official name? Well, we all know where it is. So, uh, that was about the biggest survey I've ever seen in my life because as an attorney, I'm often dealing with real property, looking at surveys. I went to the map room to take a look at this initial survey that was done for the line. And it's six feet long, rolled right down on the table. And I'd like to thank Sandy DiPerno because she gave me permission to photograph parts of the survey because they usually don't allow photography of their survey maps. They want you to make a copy of them. But you can't make, easily make a copy of a six foot long scroll. So, so I was making, uh, I took a lot of pictures of it, which we'll be seeing shortly. But the uh, survey was filed in the clerk's office in, in July of 2001. The big thing the trolley company had to deal with was, although it's five miles from the village, New Hartford, to Clinton, right here, there were 12 private parcels the trolley line had to go through. So for half of the route, all they had to do was get approval of the local government, the town of New Hartford, the village of New Hartford, the village of Clinton, and the town of Kirkland. Now they were all happy with it because they wanted the trolley to come in. Some of the private landowners weren't too happy, and here's why. Because every one of these 12 private landowners had a railroad going through their property, the New York, Ontario, and Western. Now I like trains, I don't know if I'd like them enough to have a railroad going through my property though, but these people already had the railroad going through the property, a steam railroad, and so they're being approached by the trolley people to put a 66 foot strip of land through their parcels. Some of the people uh, uh, didn't mind, they worked out good deals and one of the things I found was how much each person got, what some of the circumstances were, but a couple of them fought them tooth and nail, particularly Mark and Maria Marks from New Hartford. Uh, they were farmers. There's a Marks place in New Hartford right off of 12B. And these people gave the trolley company a good run for the money. If anyone could railroad a railway company, it was the Marks of New Hartford. They've even got a street named after, maybe because they railroaded the railway. I don't know, but, but we'll get into that in just a, in just a moment. So, and a couple of the people proved very difficult. You probably know what eminent domain is, but just a quick uh, thought on that. If the government wants your land, they're going to take it. They're going to have to give you fair value. If you don't think it's the right amount, then you can challenge it in court. Bottom line is, if they want your property, they're going to grab it from you. And so, a couple of the people really just didn't want to do anything. They didn't want to give the land to the railroad, to the trolley company. But there was a lot of peer pressure. If everyone in the community wants the trolley line, and you're the only one holding up the trolley line, that's not a good position for you to be in. So, so basically, the people all gave in at the end. They worked out their own deals with the trolley company, and construction began in August of 1901. They started both in New Hartford and Clinton, and they started working towards each other. The construction was finished in November of 01. The thing that wasn't finished in the beginning of the month was the little loop around the green here. That took about another three weeks to finish. So when the trolley came into Clinton, besides having to work out deals with private landowners and the government, the trolley line and we'll see in the video, came into Clinton uh, about maybe a third of it, well, it diverted from the railroad, because the railroad and the trolley line ran parallel for about two and a half miles. At that point, the railroad crossed what's 12B today and went towards Robinson Road. The trolley line hugged 12B. I'm never quite sure when 12B has become as Utica Street, but it hugged Utica Street and 12B for until it reached Stebbins Road, then it got right onto Utica Street. And for about the last half mile, it was in the center of the street, and 
circled the green. To get ready for the trolley, the village had to widen Utica Street by 15 feet. They had to improve drainage, and they cut a lot of trees down. So it changed the look of the village a little bit, but I don't think people were too upset by that. So just a couple quick notes about the, the videos before I get into the pictures here. One video is an audio with, with five articles that I selected um, from the, the Utica newspapers. I used a wonderful resource called FultonHistory.com. It has millions of pages of uh, microfilm New York State newspapers. You can find out a lot of things you didn't know. I found out, for instance, that my great-grandfather sold wood alcohol during the Prohibition in West Utica, and he faced federal charges, and the bail that he was given was very substantial, because I used the, uh, see what $1930 are today, it was like, let's say, $100,000, and he posted it the next morning. And that money, I can assure you, when that money didn't follow down through the family tree, I don't know what happened to it. You find all kinds of interesting things, maybe about your family history and certainly about the, the trolley. So we'll be listening to some audio with some pictures to accompany it about the opening of the line, about a motorman who worked both in Hartford and Clinton, um, about an old shed that was designed by a famous architect that for many years stood across from the Wedgwood Apartments in New Hartford and has since been moved. It was moved back to one of the houses on a private road. The people that owned it. And then we're going to learn about the condition of the line in 1935, four months before it was abandoned. And then there's a wonderful piece by a local columnist at the time, David Beatty, who wrote a number of books about the area. He was on the last ride to Clinton. The final video, the second video, will be a drone video that I took along with my friend John Ivory, who was the narrator on the uh, audio portion, uh, retracing the route from the village of New Hartford right to here in Clinton. Um, now you really can't see any part of the old right of way or anything because it's been 84 years, it's all gone. But it's the approximate, approximate route. So, excuse me, before you start, could, I'm just confused. We're new in the area, we're not from here. The, the place in New Hartford where it was, is that on off Oxford Road where the high school is now? No, it's oh. on uh, Genesee Street, right oh. in the village. Uh, okay, all right. More yeah, more I don't know, village. right in the village. Okay, thank you. Okay. Yeah, so, so we'll. Uh, Go through our pictures quick and then get into the video part. I have a question. Yep. What was the paving on the tracks? The what? The paving, paving. on the tracks. Paving? What did it consist of? Well, it was just uh, wood ties, and uh, there was downstairs in the basement, there's a section of the trolley line that was found when they were ripping up Utica Street, and I forget who donated it, but I saw it downstairs. I don't know what the weight of the rail was, but it was just. Uh, Wooden ties, uh, you know, and 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 then of course steel for the for the rails, and um, it was really good when the, they started in the beginning, of course. It, but the trolley system it couldn't compete with cars. I mentioned that in 1901 there were 15,000 automobiles in the United States. By the time the line was abandoned in 1936, there were 25 million. Roads got better, there were buses. It was too expensive for the railway company to maintain the line. They went out of business. They were bleeding cash. I heard tell that there was somewhere to check it out when Well, this line would have been abandoned in 36, five years before the war, and the Utic line was abandoned in May of 41. So maybe some of the rails eventually went, well, they were building up for war at that time anyhow, so maybe some of it went into that. I wouldn't know. But, so I was telling you guys about this uh, survey that I found. The, uh, this was not in the survey, of course. It's a drawing that appeared in the Saturday Globe the day after the line opened. And uh, we see a woman representing Utica. Oops. A professor for Hamilton College. And the trolley connecting 
Utica and the hill. The trolley, as I mentioned, was electrified. Most of you probably know that a pole connected from the trolley up to overhead wires, and that's how the trolley was powered. William McKinley, he doesn't get much credit today, but he was president when the Clinton trolley line began, so we'll give him credit for, for uh, being president during that time. He was, uh, unfortunately for him, he didn't live to see the trolley line completed as he was struck down by a bullet in Buffalo in September of 1901. He lived eight days, and uh, the next president was Theodore Roosevelt. This is the certification that accompanied the, the survey. And you'll see here that the president of the railway company was Thomas R. Proctor, a well-known local bigwig. The, the first company was called, uh, and there's all kinds of twists and turns to the corporate history, but the first company was called the Utica Suburban Railway. It then became the Utica and Mohawk Valley Railways for many years, and finally ended up as the New York State Electric Railways. And here's the title that is on the, on the survey. It's, I'll get this right eventually. It's an extension of the existing company, of the existing tracks between New Hartford and Clinton, as you see there. Now here is the, the point of beginning. This is where the tracks ended until 1901. <coughs> this is Paris Road. I always call it Old Paris Road, but it's now referred to as Paris Road. The Point School, the Village Point Apartments are, are right here. That's where the Historical Society of New Hartford has its headquarters. So this red line begins the trolley line to Clinton. Here we are in uh, farther down the, the, the road. This is Cheryl Brook. This is the present location of Utica National Insurance Company. This old road here is now known as Merrick Place. The Yanadas's golf course is up here at the clubhouse. So the trolley line came down Genesee Street. This is, uh, was known back at the time as, uh, well, eventually as Route 5. It didn't lose that designation for many years. A lot of people uh, referred to it. Some people still refer to it still as Route 5, but it's, uh, it's Genesee Street. And here's the, uh, the trolley right of way, 66 feet. The red line is the center of the trolley. This line here represents the New York, Ontario, Western Railway. As I mentioned, the railway and the trolley line uh, were very close, only 30 feet apart or so from um, up until they reached just past the Stewarts, a little bit beyond and on 12B. Right there by the kill group was all strong. Yeah. And they slowed the trolley down and we wobbled through the... Yeah, there's still, a, there's still like a pond there right now. So, okay, let me just grab this. This uh, first parcel that was purchased was owned by some guy named Aiken. This old road again is Merrick Place. Uh, within a year of uh, the survey, he sold property to someone named Merrick, for whom Merrick Place is named after. It was 50 acres. And he sold the uh, the right of way to the trolley company for $255, $7,500 today, 1.7 acres. The only other conditions were that they had to have a fence along the uh, southerly boundary and they had to have a crossing put in so that he could cross over with his wagons. So that's a common uh, condition for all these uh, transactions. The Marx family. These people were tough. You had a question here, Jim. Oh, sorry. So um, that road uh, uh, up there at the right-hand corner. This one? Uh, no, the, uh, that one. That's Genesee Street. Like the one going off the right. Well, um, well this, there, there is no, 12B would be right here, but it doesn't really show. OK, the road from the Anadas is, is the end of the arterial. Well, there was no arterial then, of course. Yeah, so the arterial would begin 
right here and go this way. We follow the, the railroad, which was abandoned in 1957. The Marxes, Mark and Maria, they gave the trolley company a really hard time. Whereas Aiken, the first one, got equipment of $7,500 for 1.7 acres, the Marks got $38,000 for 1.43 acres. They got the fence, they got the crossover, but they had a building in their uh, right of way that the, the railroad, that the trolley company wanted. He said, move our building. The trolley company said, no, we'll give you $38,000. You're going to move your own building, and you've got to move it by November 1st. So they said, okay, we'll move the building. But besides that, they were farmers. They, they farmed, they had apple trees, lots of them. Within the, uh, the 66 feet that they were giving to the uh, trolley company were a row of apple trees. So they worked out a deal with the trolley company. They get to keep the apple trees. The apple trees don't get cut down. Any fruit from the apples belongs to the marks. And any wood that's cut down here to make this uh, right of way would go to them. So they got a heck of a deal. The next one, oops, oh, sorry. Martin Rodell, very quickly. As I said, I grew up near this area. This house, he had a house, it was way back here. It always looked kind of scary to me. He sat two or three hundred feet back from the road. Looks like the Adams family house. I wonder why is that house so far back from the road? It was because when the trolley came through, they had to move his house. They agreed to give him six thousand dollars, move his house two hundred feet from its present location, they rebuilt his foundation, they dug a cellar for him seven and a half feet deep with a hatchway right to the cellar, then they put the fence and the crossway. So his house was up here closer to the road, they moved it back, the house has since been raised. I always wondered why it was back so far, that's why it was. Mr. Fitzgerald, Mr. Fitzgerald got $5,800, but something bad happened to Mr. Fitzgerald, I don't think well, I don't think it would have changed anything, but 16 years after he gave the railroad the right of way here over his property, he got run over by the Clinton trolley <laughs> right by the point school. At 10.45 one night, the trolley was coming back from Clinton. He stepped in front of it. I can't really uh, give any conjecture necessarily about why he was not in an alert state. Maybe Mr. Philo could give us some conjecture about that. But, but at 10.45 at night, he walked right in front of the trolley. He was struck. He died the next day. So poor Mr. Fitzgerald. I think the he truck. Guess his condition, huh? Yeah, I think so. He might have been. He might not have seen some of these signs our district attorney has through. The, I don't think the DA back then would have any signs about. Uh, but for whatever reason, he walked smack dab in front of the trolley. Trolleys had headlights. And uh, he might have doomed that way. The Osborne, uh, 2.9 acres, uh, 